appreciate being, you guys being able to, you know, they were able to change the schedule around for me because, uh, you know, I, I was originally scheduled to be here in the morning, but fortunately, we have a major project kicking off, which is always good, especially in, in the current times. And actually, we've been actually just recently hired two more new grads as well, so that's been good. But, uh, so this afternoon, the talk, the talk this afternoon's talk is going to be quite different than I think the, your, what you've been talking about earlier today. Um, you know, this, I'm really just going to be telling some stories, you know, sharing some experiences, so it's not going to be my tech. And the main purpose for this is, is that despite all of the technology, despite all of our knowledge and all of our ability to, you know, for good engineering design, we still end up having problems. And often these problems reoccur and keep reoccurring. So my story today is really about lessons learned. So anytime you're designing a weld, a welding components or welding procedures, a lot of factors to consider. And often the failures occur either because something goes wrong, you know, there might be a problem if you overlook the design. Quite often there's issues in quality control. Things aren't actually done the way they should be. And the other aspect is the operation. Stuff happens during operations that you may not have considered in your design. And so really what I'm going to be providing you today is, is a variety of different case studies. And, and these case studies, are, again, are, are not things necessarily that, okay, you're going to learn from this particular lesson not to do that particular thing. But what I want you guys to do is start to think a bit about the implications of, of what went wrong in these scenarios. So when you're designing or doing weld, welding on pipelines, you can take into account the bigger picture issues, not always just the very technical specifics. So a couple things on lessons learned is um, it's important and you'll start seeing this reflected in the codes and standards. So there's a new edition of CSA uh, Z662 coming out uh, 2015 in July and one of the things in their um, safety loss management system section 3 is they put in here it's the, the importance of a process for continual improvement of which a big part of it is a process for learning from events. So it's kind of interesting that the you know your CSA design code is really talking about uh, lessons learned. You also see it in if you take industries that have been around for a long time and have really good integrity programs like the chemical industry. So that, that's Dow and Dupont, those kinds of companies. So if you take a look at the chemical companies, you know and they've been they've been doing they've been in the forefront of good processes for years, and from their uh, I work with a couple of pretty good guys there that are part of the Center for Chemical Process Safety. They have their vision 2020. And one of the core things that they're putting out there is one of the biggest things the chemical industry needs to do is enhanced application for, for lesson learned. And they put it as a thirst for learning from instance, near missing, near misses. And the changes are implemented based on the lessons learned. So even in industries where they've got very mature programs, a lot of good safety programs in place, they continue to emphasize the importance of capturing, communicating, and making changes in lessons learned. Um, you had a, had a, well, you had a, had a gentleman from Enbridge, uh, Trevor, it was Trevor Gray, was here today? Yeah. So I don't think he, I, I took a quick look through his presentation, and I don't think he talked about this, but we do a fair bit of work with Enbridge, and one of the things they have is they've got a, an event learning process that they put a lot of work in. And their event learning process is a comprehensive approach for managing preventative and corrective actions. And so what they're saying here is that it's a key part, <coughs> a key part of the process of the intent of being trained and evaluation to identify systemic issues. So companies like Enbridge again are putting a lot of work into lessons learned. So I'm going to start going through some stories, just some basic examples. Here. So this is one that I've. This, this is one I've, I've used a number of times over the past. This is just on a standard 8-inch grade 290 pipe X42. You know, this was in a, on a sour gas system. Um, but it's typical, you know, that, you know, for, you know for really a low strength pipe, hardness values in the welds were all in the acceptable range. And this was a, this failure is a result of poor fit up, the concentrated stress at the root, root of the weld. So that doesn't look very good, does it? shouldn't be making welds like that. So chances are the design was fine. I mean, this is a looks like a transition joint here. They were, you know, going from 
they were supposed to be putting in a transition here. But they clearly, you know, terrible job on the fit up. You know, cook in, you know, I'm certain there must have been some MVP on as well, but obviously they got missed. So there's nothing wrong from a from a hardness point of view as well. But once you concentrate the stress, so bad quality control, bad fit up, bad quality control, you end up with a catastrophic failure. So another example of, of things that can go wrong, this is, a, this is another uh, uh, sulfide stress cracking failure. This was on a, some low temp, two inch plant welded onto a T. And again, this excessively hard microstructure. I mean, these are common materials used in sour service all the time, you know, basically equivalent to what a grade 240. Yeah. But again, ended up with really hard, hard, um, hard welds. And the hardness was attributed to a lack of preheat during field fabrication. So again, things are designed right. You know, they've designed the weld right, probably had the right weld procedure, did everything right, but they're welding. But then when the guys are out welding in the, in the low temperature and cold, you know, it didn't properly preheat, didn't properly wrap and control cooling. Next thing you know, you end up with a catastrophic failure. So things like weld blanketing, you we can improvise if you have to, but you know, you know, you got to control your control your cooling. So the next two failures I'm going to I'm going to talk about are um, th these happen on a on a high pressure sour gas line. So this this line was designed and built back in the late '80s by you know by a, a multinational oil and gas company. These guys had good engineers. They had very good understanding of, of sour service materials and sour service well. And this pipeline is um, still operating today. You know, it's been a, a very long, successful career with very few problems, except right at the startup. And the reason it's not a problem at the startup is because they missed a couple things. So even though you've got good people, good designs, you miss things. And one of the ones was is that they um, one of the one of the challenges they did. And this is one of the, one of the, like, an important lesson learned is up until. Fairly up until around that time, most pipelines being built in sour service were typically about a grade 359. So people tended to default to grade 290s, grade 359, so lower strength, lower carbon materials. Because when you start getting to higher strengths, you start taking a few more chances. Well, these guys wanted to go thinner wall, they went with higher strength. They did some other things too, they welded in valves, which you know they were trying to at that point, because this is 30% H2S, they were trying to eliminate the number of flanges. So they, they, they pushed the envelopes a little bit on, 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 on what was common practice at that time. And they got caught because they missed a couple of things. So one of the, one of the failures was is that they welded in this two inch flange, or two, sorry, two inch valve onto, uh, so it was just a, it was at the end of the line, so it was an attachment, uh, you know, just blow down valve or instrumentation valve. But the valve itself, when they welded it in, you know, the carbon equivalent of that valve was, was 0.52. So normally when you're dealing with, you know, in sour service environments, you want to be about a, below a 0.4 in terms of your carbon equivalent, 0.43. And they didn't use any post oil heat treatment because the standard rule of thumb at that time was anything less than 3 eighths of an inch, you know, you didn't post oil heat treatment. So the micro hardness of the weld that failed the game was very high, you know, 350 to 420 acres. And this, this this one failed six hours after starting. And that was, when, you know, that was when I was working my Chevron days, that line that was coming into one of the Chevron plants, there was a huge you know, vapor cloud and sour gas at 30% H2S drifting across the road. You know, so it didn't kill anybody, you know, no one got hurt, but, but it could have been. And this again, the other lesson in here, this is a dry line. This line was completely, at least expected to be thoroughly dry. So basically if you have no water, shouldn't have had, you know, uh, sulfide stress crack. But there was just enough trace water combined with the right circumstances and physical stress that cracked and failed catastrophic. So, like I say, the vast majority of the pipeline's fine. You know, the welding was good, the design was good, the coatings were good, but you gotta be careful. Small things you try and do different, like welding in a, welding in a valve, they got caught. That wasn't the only one that got caught on. They also were manufacturing some fittings, again, out of a higher strength material. They were using 5, 5 16, 70 plate, which is very commonly used, you know, in a lot of, you know, commonly used in, um, you know, in pressure vessels all the time. 
and it's in solid surface. So it's not a problem with the material. But what they were doing is they were using a, a, gap, a wire. Because they were using higher strength materials, they used a, a higher strength wire, a higher strength electrode. And by doing that, the, they ended up with a carbon equivalent in the well of 0.58. So this got missed during the well procedure development. And so this one failed within seven days. So after they managed to get the, uh, the first failure fixed and get the line started back up, bang, they cracked some more welds, had another failure. And in this case, they had to go back in and, and dig up all these fittings and replace them all. So it delayed their startup significantly. It cost an enormous amount of money. It also puts a lot of lack of confidence in your system, too. You wonder, well, what else did we miss? So you the point carbon Well, you know, the thing is, is it, it's, it's, it's true, but I mean, these, the, the thing that's, it'd be interesting to really understand some of the root causes behind this, because this company is a major multinational oil and gas company, and they, they did a lot of good welding engineers and a lot of good materials engineers, but they, they missed it in the procedure development. And so a lot of times people weren't necessarily doing carbon equivalents. They, just, they, were, they were worried about them. Normally you're doing your, uh, your mechanical testing, making sure all your mechanical properties are good in the well procedure. But it's only been more recently in the last number of years that people are doing a lot of hardness testing. Uh, or even in CSA requiring people to even know what the carbon equivalent is. So and, and Another, this is just a recent example from a couple weeks ago. So this is an ERW pipe. This is actually a, an ERW seam split in a ERW in a, in a pipe mill. And so, so it's just part of the normal process in quality, you know, quality uh, control on a pipe mill. So usually there's there's two forms of NDT. So right after welding, there's usually there's going to be uh, there's going to be ultrasonic examination of the weld, and then do that right after welding just to make sure there's no obvious defects. Then they go through and do a, uh, do a final um, phased array ultrasonic examination of all the wells. And then they go through to the hydro test bench just to make sure, do a 10-second you know, hydro, really fast hydro test to make sure that they haven't missed anything. The trouble was here is we ended up, ended up bursting two of these joints. And so, the, so the, the immediate answer was, okay, well, we caught problems, check good to go. Well, hold on. Like why, the question is, is why did these burst? So essentially, they burst because there's a weld there's a, there's a weld seam defect, and so then you got to find out well why did the why did the ultrasonic inspection miss the weld seam defect, and what does that mean for the rest of the pipe? So the, the lesson learned here is that the, you know even though the hydro test is meant as a as a tool to get rid of residual defects, you also have to go back and take a look at this case and. Going back to take a look at what what did they miss and why what does that mean for the rest of the pipe that's the back? Okay. Okay. So sometimes when I'm talking about a lot of these things, I'm assuming you guys all have a pretty good background understanding of like the sour service welding and all these materials, all these numbers. So is, is that is that okay? Because I'm I'm not going into any detail here. I think you can give a little bit of background as a when you get into these uh, details. Okay, a little more background. Okay. Yeah, the, 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 if you drop a number, I think many of us uh, will, will not be able to say the number is just higher though. Okay, yeah. So just a couple of things when I talked about these, you know, the sort of the standard number in sour service is about 248. So you want to be below 248 Vickers. And so, so almost everything in sour service, the, the procedures, all your well procedures, everything's designed to then be down below that number. So once you start getting up into the 300s, you're into that zone where your residual stresses are so high that it makes you very susceptible to uh, sulfide stress factor. Yeah. 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 I don't. I'm surprised they use it. But it, it's interesting. And then they just. Yeah. A little, little side note on that is kind of, one of the things that's interesting is we do work overseas as well, so we've done a bunch of pipeline related work in the Netherlands. And one of the things they use there is, is they don't use a lot of the same welding processes. They use actually use gas dumps and arc welding to further all the pipeline wells, which is really a slow process. And they use seamless pipe. They don't actually use ERWs. They're starting to now. But, you know, 
But the other thing about working in the Netherlands is the pipe, when we started inspecting pipelines that were built 40 years ago, there was no problems. They didn't fail. So they put a lot of, you know, what we look at is maybe slow in terms of production, but the quality was excellent. So they didn't have, a lot of the problems we had with ex bad external coatings and bad sleeves, you know, bad anchor blocks and lots of problems that you'll see. They didn't have those problems because the quality control in the Netherlands, you know, the, the, the stuff I, we worked on was excellent. So, so long, so you go inspect a line that's 40 years old, perfect, like you're able to build. On the uh, ERWC fire test, you said they use special electronics in the plant to let them make Yes. Yeah. yeah, they run it through. It's a pretty fast process, though, mm -hmm. you know, because it, it's mass production. So it's going through the gate really quick. Yeah. So you can always miss some things, which is, yeah. you know, you do the hydro, and then sometimes you might do afternoon inspection. And you straight up and down the. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. Which if you're not doing it, then you're going to miss, or you're not using curve for rays, you're going to miss. Yeah, and I think. I don't know specifically how they set it up there, but their their the process the process they're using on, on their phased array is is I think a tandem. I think it's on both sides. I can't remember for sure. Okay. <coughs> I know I know, but it is interesting that uh, that it missed us. So yeah. that raised a lot of concerns. I had experience on forage pipe similar to that, only it didn't open right up. Where we were testing it at uh, eighteen hundred psi. And the seam opened it up enough to spray a mist out, and then once we dropped the pressure, it stopped. Yeah. We cut that out and sent it down to I think, uh, Ohio somewhere for analyzing. We, any, anything we made with that heat number on it, we cut it apart, scrapped it. Yeah. Huge cost. Yeah. But you know that, that the kind of the reason that becomes so important though is you don't want to leave one of these one of these lingering doubts because one, if, if, if there is a problem with that. Once it's in service, it's really hard to go back and inspect for it. You're, you, you're just left with this uncertainty that sticks with you the rest of the life of the pipeline. And some of the failures I'm going to show you, they, they, didn't, they didn't fail until 25 years later after the events that caused it initiated the cracks occurred. So sometimes you leave these lingering things, they come back to haunt you. So another one, another failure that's kind of interesting that um, Again, this was a failure that happened of a major multinational company that came with really good people who know what to do. Um, they had an internal corrosion failure back in 97. Quite sour gas line. The reason I keep using all these sour gas ones is because I've done a lot of work on that, so that depends on my, my, my pool of, of knowledge and failures. But, uh, so this line was, um, had an internal corrosion failure, so they replaced it, you know, you know, that July, and then they put it back and redid the repair. We put a new section of pipe in, welded it up, repaired it, put it back in service, and it failed. And, you know, actually within a few days of startup, you know, or within a few weeks of startup. And the reason was here is because when they um, they left a little bit, oh, sorry, the reason the reason this one failed was because they left there was a little bit of undercut that was allowable by code at the time. CSA code has since changed. A little bit undercut on the roof, but because of the, you, you know, when you take a nice piece of line that's been in service for a few years and you excavate it and put a new line and put a new section in, you've disturbed a lot of ground. And so now you've got your pieces of pipe here anchored on solid ground, and then you've got your loose backfill in where you put your repair, and that soil settlement puts additional stress on the line. And so there's so the additional stress of the soil settlement with a little bit of a notch in the root, and then you get in a wet sour environment, now you've got enough residuals, enough stress, it's cracked. So the well procedure was probably perfectly fine, nothing wrong with the well procedure, nothing wrong with the NDT they did, everything was everything was fine. But what they didn't do is proper compaction and understanding to make sure they weren't putting that additional stress on that line. There's another one that failed too, actually, when they were building the Alliance pipeline. Um, they did an open cut across some, a water line, a water injection line. And water, the water injection lines in those days were made with, uh, we, used, we used to use cement line pipe. These, these are old lines. And, but the cement line pipe, you could never do a full, pen, a full uh, penetration weld because of the cement. You know. 
So the bottom of the dock, you actually left a little bit of an internal gap, which is fine, you know, for a water line. But what happened when they built the Lions pipeline and went underneath it, though in those days it didn't bore, they overcut it. And same thing happened. Backfill around it, everything looks good, but the, again, this, as the soil settled, that notch was in that well. That well had been there for, that cement line well had been there for uh, 20 years, no problem. But then when you got the additional stress now of soil settlement because of the because of the line pipeline crossing, it cracked and broke. So, well, nothing wrong with the, the well was fine, everything was fine. It's just that now all of a sudden it was introduced a change to the system and added this additional stress. So the other one I want to talk a little bit about is that, because I heard this term at, a, at the NEB safety conference a couple of years ago, tombstone legislation. And tombstone legislation comes from the, some of these major failures that have occurred, like San Bruno recently, and Collins Black quite a number of years ago, and one in Bellingham, where people get killed. And, and where, or even uh, Kalamazoo, you know, like major oil spills. And what happens is the result of these failures, people go back and, and when they look at the root causes, they say, well, what happened? And, and then the right government and the industry said, okay, we've got to make some changes in our, in our regulations, in our, in our codes and our standards and so and, and this is the problem that comes in when companies say they're going to follow, we're going to follow all of the codes and standards, and that's what we're going to do. The codes and standards are never enough. They lag behind industry knowledge, and they are never enough to properly manage the integrity of the system. But every time, so every time a major disaster occurs, then they have to keep upping it. So I'm going to show you a couple case studies of an example of how that happens. And so these are um, a couple case studies. There was a whole series of, of pipeline failures in the late 90s, early 2000s that resulted in significant changes to the CSA code. And the reason is, is that is that companies that actually had good knowledge of these kinds of problems, designed and built and operated these systems, they understood the kinds of problems that could occur. And so these, these, a lot of these failures weren't occurring in the products. But as the major companies sold off all their assets and lots of new operators came in and bought these assets, they said, well, we don't want to do what the big companies did. That's way too, way too expensive. That's just cost too much money. We're going to do it faster and cheaper. And the result was all kinds of failures. So just a couple of examples. Um, again, these, a lot of problems tend to occur where you're putting additional stress on your lines. So this was at a, what is, at a slip on flange, an anchor block. So a lot of times when pipelines are coming up out of the ground, they'll often, they'll often at, those, at those connections, they'll put in anchor blocks to, you know, to, to make sure that riser is, is anchored properly and also to take up sometimes some of the thermal expansion so you don't get a problem with that. And in this case, there was a misalignment that contributed to the bending stress. A lot of thermal, thermal expansion, you know, that occurred during the welding. And they ended up with a buckler going on. So, and, they, and the biggest problem here is, they, is the inspectors didn't inspect this before backfilling. If someone had actually done proper pain QC, they would have caught it. So it passed the hydro test, but it failed as soon as they started adding sour gas to it. So this is an example of what an anchor block, you know, should look like. You know, a support, nice. Everything kind of nice and straight. And this is what this one actually looked like. It doesn't look like very good quality craftsmanship, does it? So you have to be aware that sometimes you may think you're going to, you know, people in the field are going to do everything right, but sometimes people, people, if you don't pay attention to it, there are companies that do take shortcuts. This ended up cracking the field. Another example, this was a, a game failed at a pipe in a transition fitting. Yeah, it only took 10 days. Again, is a wet 30% H2S. Dehydrated line again, so it should have been dry. But it cracked along the weld on the pipeline side. And again, they said there was a small weld root flaw that may have acted as a stress rise initiated the crack. Again, the hardness was all in the acceptable range, but the root, the root, and the root bead defects were allowable according to the code at the time. So pre-2005, CSA didn't have, have, uh, have, have limitations on it. A lot of companies, when I used to work for Chevron, Chevron and Shell, we all had control. We, did, we said, no, no repeat defects. We didn't care what the code said. We said, no repeat defects in service because of that stress concentration. 
But when other companies started building, they said, we're just going to build for the, you know, the big companies went away, the small companies said, well, we're just going to build for the minimum code. The result is, is a lot of these small stress rises with them because of group of defects. If you combine that with some bad design, and then you have failures. Okay, and these are catastrophic failures. Part of the reason these come up is a lot of pipeline failures are corrosion, they're pitting, so you get small releases. The reason these are such a big concern is because when you have a when you have a cracking related failure, it can be catastrophic. I know when I was used to live down around Turner Valley, and there was a big there was one of these failures occurred actually near Yellowville. You know, so they shut down the whole highway, evacuated all kinds of people, and it's huge because you could actually kill someone with a failure. And, and the company that actually had that failure, I think, just about went bankrupt because then they had to go back and prove that all the rest of their risers and stuff they built were actually done right. It cost them millions. So again, these are catastrophic failures. Poor quality loan, bad stock stock. So this resulted in that presentation, the, the EUB or the A, currently the, A, the Alberta Energy Regulator. They, they put together a whole presentation. They had about 11 or 12 of these failures in this presentation. And the result of that, that um, these failures, is that they made significant changes to both solar service and welding requirements in CSA. So they're all built, so that to try and prevent all those things now, there's a lot of requirements built into the codes. So this case history, I've got a little more detail on. And so this is, um, Sorry, at the start there, one of, one of the people I want to acknowledge is, is Howard Wallace of the AR. So Howard and I are both, um, you know, we are both welders back in our distant past. And, uh, and we've done a lot of uh, presentations together and worked together on a lot of different welding related issues. And so Howard dug into the archives of the, the public record to talk a bit about the Rainbow Pipeline and Camrose Pipeline builders. So there's some good information here to uh, share with you guys. So, even the Rainbow Pipeline was built a long time ago, 1967. But there was a fairly significant failure that happened in about 2010. I don't know if people remember that, that failure. It caused a huge amount of problems in the province. <coughs> once, that main, once the Rainbow Pipeline was shut in, there was all kinds of producers' oil was shut in. There was nowhere to go. Actually, I got involved in a really big failure investigation because of this. Because one of the other guys who tied into this, they ended up being shut down for four months. And they didn't actually purge out their line. You know, they, they couldn't actually do it. it and so they, they didn't go through the, they thought it was okay. And the result of the line being shut in with, with oil and a little bit of water in it, if it was bacteria, they ended up with a corrosion failure. It cost them millions of dollars, abandoned the whole pipe. And, and it was directly related because this line failed, they got shut in. They didn't do anything about being shut in. It was very difficult and expensive to do something. They got caught, cost them the whole pipeline, and millions of dollars. So this had a ripple effect. But, so this, this failure occurred at a, at a well on pipe piece lead used for the repair. So these, we don't, I don't think we do any, I don't, I'm pretty sure no one does this anymore. It was done for years. But back, back in the 80s, you know, when they, when they do inspections and have external corrosion problems or corrosion, you know, external corrosion problems on these pipelines, this was, a, this was a practice that was actually used in a number of places where they actually put an external sleeve on over top of the external corrosion and then <coughs> weld it on. And being, being a pipeline weld, when people do pipeline welds, we often use, you know, cellulose or electrode. So your typical pipeline weld is done with this, you know, 70 10, 60 10, 70 10 electrode, you know, cellulose or electrode, rather than the little hydrogen we typically use. So this, this picture, unfortunately, is a bit flat, the bottom of the pipe, so the crack initiated here and actually split right through the, right through the body of the pipe itself. So this failure happened in 2010, but it wasn't the first time this had happened. So back in, in 1985, a big rupture occurred near Camrose. And the cause of the rupture was due to the sudden propagation of a crack in a fillet weld on a full encirclement repair sleeve, which was exactly the same as the sleeve you saw. And it had been installed in, it had been installed in 1973 on, on a 6-inch LPG line. So the pipeline was X52, 
that was manufactured in the 1950s, but the carbon equivalent was really high, 0.49. And that's something that you guys have to be aware of when you're out there working. So there's a whole bunch of these pipelines. They're all up there still. They're all up there still operating. So, the, really, and you, you, so when you think of an X52 or a grade 359 today, and you look at the codes and requirements, the carbon equivalents are really low. The carbon is maybe 0 0.2, 0 0.3 maybe max. And, and, but these old lines out there, the strength, the strength came from carbon. And, and so you're going you're to keep running into this. So again, they had a, a full encirclement sleeve that was filled out into the pipeline using cellulose coated electrodes. While the line was in service, which we wouldn't do, you know, so of course you get the quenching effect. So the, rup the rupture was effect was determined to, from the heat effect of the hydrogen crack at the toe of one of the wells. So as a result of that failure, which was a very serious failure at the time, this pipeline was, was regulated by the National Energy Board. And in 1990, the National Energy Board issued a directive to address the findings of, the, of, this, of this failure investigation. And so what they did is they required all operators of the pipelines under its jurisdiction to conduct an examination of hydrogen cracking. So any of these, any of the pipelines. So in other words, what they said is, if anybody else has done the same thing, put this kind of sleeve on, you better go look for cracks if you've done this. So back to uh, the Rainbow Pipeline. So this pipeline was built in 1967. So right around the time that that failure occurred, they were doing exactly the same thing in the 1980s. Now some of this was probably done prior to that failure occurring or before it became an industry knowledge problem. But they were doing the same thing. They were welding on exactly the same kind of sleeves, repair sleeves, using exactly the same kind of procedure. And so when the line failed in, 19, in, in 2010, it was 43 years after startup and 25 years after the repair, after the actual repairs occurred. So how did that happen? So a pipe was grade 359, you know, game, you know, an X52, so really common. Lots and lots of pipelines built in our own specifications. Um, carbon equivalent was really high again, exceeded for example, what's allowed now. And again, they welded with cellulose, cellulose direct electrodes, you know, similar to the previous one. So it's like 7010 type electrode. And it failed to delay hydrogen cold crack. And just for, you know, again, for welding, you know, welding background, is this, I can't remember what book I pulled this out of when I did that a while ago. But this shows that, you know, the differences between a low hydrogen electrode, which we use a lot of times to control things like hydrogen cold cracking, you know, very, have a very low PDM of hydrogen, whereas the cellulose, like 6010, 7010, 8010 type electrode, have very high uh, hydrogen. So hydrogen cold cracking is simply that what happens in, in, in welds is if you have hydrogen trapped in your weld and you have a fairly fast, uh, high, high, carb, high carbon equivalent welds, you end up with high residual stress, and, and the hydrogen causes that hydrogen brittlement, which can lead to cracking, and it can lead to cracking right away. I remember I used to be welding up, um, I was doing repair welds on uh, garbage trucks back in my youth, and it was, it was interesting because they, they were made out of real high carbon steel, and so I was welding away, I'd weld it up, and it looked really good, and I'd come back, you know, after after my break, and the weld would be cracked. So I'd weld it up again, come back, and it would crack again. Fortunately, it was just a garbage truck. But when you do that, you get uh, that's what happens. You get the right environment, which is why they have low hydrogen electrodes now. They were invented to create for some that problem. It's a lesson learned. So the interesting thing about these cracks is these cracks were there right away. Just like I explained, is it one of the standard things in welding inspection now? If you're if you're doing a, if you're doing MPI, like looking for these kinds of cracks, you do it. The rule of thumb is you do it or you do it 48 hours after the weld has been completed and cooled. Because it takes time, a lot of times, for these cracks to occur. So you can miss it. If you weld it up and then do your inspection and then leave it, eight, ten hours later it's a crack. And these cracks were in there when they did these weld repairs in 1980. Those those welds cracked probably within a number of hours or days after being after being completed. Those cracks were there for years. And they typically occur again in areas where there's really high hardness. Some of the hardness is 
546 acres. And again, a reasonable hardness is around 240, 220, 210. It's extremely hard. And these were at the well pumps. Um, and these were possibly repair wells made after the main well was completed. So it's just an example here. You can see that the, these aren't the prettiest wells. You can see it cracked right through the well. There's one that failed. And this is an example of how the crack occurred. So you end up with these areas where you get this, you know, uh, hydrogen coal crack in these wells. Like I said, here from here. So here's an example. So it occurred right at the toe of the well. So this is from the two, through, uh, through wall cracks here. So this, this is the line that failed. And this, these are sort of typical specifications. So, you know, Z245, a typical spec for, for uh, you know, this type of grade 359 X would be 0 0.26 max carbon. At time API, it's at 0 0.28, and this is 0 0.31. So higher carbon. Um, and you can take a look at the carbon equivalent. CSA, the carbon equivalent max is 0.4. This, this carbon equivalent here is 0.5. So it's much, much higher. At the time, according to the late ladle analysis, so this would have been actually within specification when it was built, according to the code. And just one of, so people still have their old tech, their, their old textbooks are useful. I took this, I took this is just from one of my old textbooks back from my safe days, actually. And it just shows that difference that when you're dealing with a high carbon steel, if you don't control your heat, so without preheat, and in this case, they were welding on lines that had liquid flowing through them, so they had additional quenching effect. So it's like doing a hot cap today. And so they were welding on lines with liquid moving through the, the cooled it in a very high carbon equivalent. And so just, just in general, if you have a low carbon steel, even if you don't control your heat as well, your hardness is only going to—it's it's not, it's not going to get too much. You know, it's not going to be too bad. But in a high carbon steel, you can lower your hardness. Your hardness, your, your hardness will go way up. You get extremely high hardness. So this is just an example of this. So again, these are bigger hard, bigger hardness numbers. So you can see that the uh, parent material at 206, 184, 198. No problem with that. That's, that's a very low hardness. You know, when you take a look at the weld, 165, 176, or the, 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 uh, the plate being welded on, and then you take a look at the bulk weld, you know, 239, 218. Nothing wrong with any of these hardness. That's all perfectly good. But if you take a look where it cracked, right where the, right where the, the last bit of welding occurred, just when they did that at the toe of the weld, Right in here, you get the most the, ra the most rapid quenching occurring. So the last thing it doesn't get re it doesn't get reheated by by pre by the subsequent passes. Here at now 4, 465, 528, 513. So this area right here, extremely high residual stresses. And so that's why it cracked right away. Those hardnesses were there from the day it was welded. High residual stress attack. And again, the reason part of the reason is a combination of this. But also, there's hydrogen trapped in here as well. The hydrogen from the um, cellulose of the electrodes. So this is just uh, an example. If we do hot taps nowadays, for years now, what we do is we always do the final pass up high so that you actually temper that last piece of pipe. So again, this is being welded onto the pipe with liquid going through it. But by welding up here, you actually you know, you reheat and temper that, that, that zone so you can reduce the hydrogen. So how did, why did this line fail? So the, the repair sleeves were put on in the 1980s and that crack. Around 1990, people thought, well, did the NEB put out a bulletin saying, if you have something like this, then you've got a problem and you need to inspect. So this is, the, this is probably one of the most important parts of this, of this talk here, is it? There was information that told the operators of this pipeline, you have a problem. There was suggestions that they went back and dug up these lines, dug up these, these sleeve locations that they put in and inspected them. But there was no records. There's no proof. 
So you can imagine if you went out and did major excavations on the line and did a whole bunch of NDT and didn't, and no one can find any record of it. Mm. That's not good. So, so, so then the other question is: is that the other problem that happened is that if there was a there was a um, a failure or, or or near this location where this line actually failed, there was additional external corrosion happening. So back in around 2010, they went in and found this and they dug up very close to this sleeve. So right where the sleeve was, they were just down the road from it, there was another spot where there was external corrosion. So again, they excavated a big area around the line. So there might have been 20 meters, depending on what report I read, sometimes it said 20 meters exposed, some 70 meters exposed. The repair sleeve was exposed at the time, but it's the sleeve that failed. But they didn't do any, any additional NDT on it. They didn't go back and no one understood or no one remembered about this NED bullet. So no one went back and looked at it. And same as the other example I showed you, now as a result of having dug up this line and then you've got this compaction, now you bury it again and then the soil starts to settle. What's additional stress? And they also felt that um, there was some some additional stress put on it due to the spring thaw and associated ground movement. And so eventually, at this existing crack that had been there for 25 years, digging it up, disturbing the ground, resulted in additional stress that reached that crack intensity factor, stress intensity factor, and had a brittle fracture occurred. So, to go back to that other picture, the line failed catastrophic. Huge oil spill, big problem. And then the other problem is, well, now you've got a whole bunch of these sleeves. And now you can't just fix one. You can't just fix this. You've got to go fix them all. And so then you're down for months and months and months. So a couple things there. The failure report conclusions is that you know, failure to follow the weld procedure, high carbon equivalent, failure to detect a small crack due to two separate inspections and they missed the crack both times, if, even if they, did, if they did it up, dug it up in 1990. And then there was a bending, additional bending stress. And it was very poor toughness of the pipe. So in those days, you know, people didn't do like cat a cat to the pipe. The pipe didn't have a lot of uh, impact, a lot of uh, ductility. So a big thing that the AER, when they did their report after the 2010, is that it was known that these sleeves were a problem, but the operator didn't really manage the risk of these sleeves. They didn't go back and say, when they did risk assessment from the line, saying, are we sure that we don't have a problem? And like I said, when this, this, this pipeline, they didn't have to go back and inspect it because this pipeline wasn't under NEB jurisdiction. So the NEB said, everybody who's under our jurisdiction need to do this. But these guys, these guys potentially might have said, well, it's not under the NEB jurisdiction, so we don't need to do it. I suspect that's what happened because there's no records of the inspection. But the big thing was is when the, when the EOCB, these guys keep changing their name. So you'll see some of my stuff says EUB, some says ERCB, and some says AER. They're all the same, they're all the same government body. The Energy Resources Conservation Board, the Energy Utility Board, and the Energy Regulator. They just keep changing their names. <coughs> but they, had, they, did, they did a bunch of digs, and 10 of 11 of these sleeves that were inspected in 2010 were cracked. So that's why I suspect that nothing was actually dug up and inspected in 1990 because everything they looked at was cracked when they, when they looked at it now. So root cause analysis, key things is that, you know, welding with cellulose electrode, the hydrogen is delayed with hydrogen cracking, well, lack of fault of the welding procedure is considered using high, low hydrogen. They didn't have an integrity program or risk assessment that addressed the fact that these sleeves were there. And then the backfilling procedures weren't adequate and it resulted in a high access stress on the line. There was other issues too about these there, but, but so it's, it's a combination of circumstances that, that ended up in these kinds of failures. So the big thing is is, is Is when you're is, is looking back over the history, they failed, failed to assess the history, gained an inadequate background. So you end up with a combination of things that lead to these kinds of failures. 
So one of the things they did as a result of that is they issued a, the, the RCB issued a directive, you know, on using cellulose uh, welding consumables. Again, these are very common electrodes to use on pipelines, but if you're doing air welding and other things, you shouldn't be using them. Example of again regulations changing and requirements. <coughs> so just a quick summary here. Um, most major failures typically result of compounding problems of system breakdowns. You know, something like the classic Swiss cheese model. Things don't usually fail just from one thing. It usually fails from a whole variety of things in your system going wrong. So the more things you do right, the less chance of less chance of error you have. Hydrogen charging, you know, we think we got the problem beat, but it's, you know, we've known about it for a long time, but it still occurs. And the other one was rapid cooling of the welding while the pipe was in service. So when we do hot taps, this has been well, well addressed and thought out over the last number of years. But anytime you can get rapid cooling, you can end up with a high hardness residual stress. And again, this thing cracked right away, but it took 25 years for the right set of circumstances for it to fail. And I've run into that a number of times in my, we were just doing a big risk assessment on a project today, is for plants. And one of the things they wanted to know is that, well, these plants have been in operation for years, so we shouldn't have much of a concern about, say, low impact properties. Said, no. You know, I've seen several very catastrophic failures in pipe that was built out of A106 or non-impact testing materials. And it's still in, 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 in the ambient environment where it can be minus 40. But it, and it just took sometimes 20 years, sometimes 30 years for the right set of circumstances to occur. And when you get cold enough at the, at the, at the right time, and the failure will occur. So these things can sneak up on. So, so the, as engineers, you need to understand the issues that apply and apply lessons learned appropriately in projects. And those are often through specifications and procedures. You know, when I've worked for major oil and gas companies, every time we learn a new lesson, we change our specs, we try and prevent those things from occurring. We also try and train and, and, and qualify people when they work. A lot of times mistakes happen because people don't realize what they're doing. So some of those quality problems are often back to training the companies. Companies need to apply lessons learned quickly and effectively. Like that type B sleeve lesson should have been caught and, and through industry and people addressed it. In the airline, do you think that happens in the airline industry? When there's a major, when a plane crashes, they, they say that this part is defective on these types of planes. Everybody in the world goes and addresses it. One company doesn't say, well, that doesn't apply to me because that's a different, that's, that, you know, that plane's got under a different regulator. I'm not going to fix that. That's kind of what happened here. And the other thing is, is that um, eventually, regulators and industry apply lessons learned by changes to codes and standards. But this is a very long process. It sometimes has unintended consequences. Sometimes when you put things in codes as a result of failures, it causes a lot of problems in the industry. That's what happens in the pipeline industry in the US. The US regulation in response to has gotten very prescriptive, which, which is very difficult sometimes. It costs companies enormous amounts of money, perhaps unnecessarily. But they do it because of some of these failures that occur because of neglect. So, the last thing is the lessons have been shared are, are you know, you know, people might look at these and say, well, these are these are pretty well known, and we'd, we'd never do that today, um, which is probably true. I mean, a lot of these things have been dealt with. But the important thing is, with the advances in materials and welding technologies, there's going to be new and unexpected problems. So when you, as you guys go through your career, you're going, to, you're going to come across things that some some of these problems occurred because people at the time were pushing the limits of technology and their understanding. And, and you guys, especially young people in your early in your careers, you're going to be doing that a lot. And so you have to be aware that there can be problems every time you try and do that. Like that OBET line, that's one of the reasons I tried to emphasize that one. They tried, they were pushing the limits. They, were good, they had a good engineering company. You know, they had good engineering in their company, but they pushed the limits and they got caught. The other thing is, is that all that old stuff is out there. I was just working on some pipeline abandonment issues for transmission lines, and, and someone pointed out, no one's abandoned it. So the, these big transmission lines that were built in the you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, they're all there. They're all operating. They all still have that. You guys might get involved and in deal with these like They're still out there with all these problems. There's a whole bunch of them that run right through Edmonton. Like all that stuff through Mill Woods there, that big pipeline corridor. It's 
pipelines out there that were built in the 1950s, and some was one of them that I was still always worried about. It's failed twice on it. It even killed somebody else. It's still operating. It's still there. So there was a, a big failure in California. So don't know what the actual cause was yet, but would anybody think that it was because of some new, unexpected, un unheard of thing? Probably not. No. Probably not. Probably something we knew how to prevent. And and for us, you know, we're talking about pipelines today, and and, and oil and gas in Alberta. This kind of stuff kills us. Like how, how do you how do you go convince the people in BC that we're going to build a pipeline through it through it through BC when the pipeline industry is pumping oil out into the into uh, into the, on the coast of California? So every time one of these things happens, it hurts the whole industry, it hurts us all. And yeah, this one made me mad. This has, the engine gets a lot of business assets. Okay, any questions? steels we're using are low carbon equipment. The typical steels we use now in small diameter stuff anyways is very low carbon equipment. So you almost never get any problems. And whereas above it, when you're welding pipeline piping, for example, thick wall piping tends to have higher carbon, seamless pipes have higher carbon equipment and tends to be thicker so you've got a faster cooling or you know, more of a quench. So you're right, it, the production welding on pipelines is still all down the side of all steel like And it's not really a problem. Where these guys got caught is they were doing repair wells on live lines with high carbon equivalents. So they have the cooling effect of the liquid combined with the fact that they have the high carbon equivalents, and that's where they got caught. So the other question is, uh, <coughs> you need to say 50s or 60s pipelines, right? Yeah. You, you need to repair it. How do you make a weld procedure if you don't have that material? Well, you, you have to go, you, you have to simulated actually and, and the company that did this repair actually after this line failed and they had to go in and do the repairs what they did is they actually borrowed I think a repair procedure from Enbridge because Enbridge had actually developed a, a repair procedure for these high carbon equipment lines. But they initially have sold for and all kind of other bad stuff right? So oh yeah. Right? yeah. How do you make a procedure? I think those materials are so widely variable. They are, they are but they're most of the old steels are, are pretty plain jane. You know, they're you know they were all built from you know iron ore, so they have certain they don't have the micro alloys that we have in a lot of steels today. You know, from, from electric arc furnace wells, the steels that are made pipelines, and so so it really it's around controlling. It's it's really controlling your heat input and making sure you're doing proper preheats. And, and you can do like a temper heat type procedures, and and it's actually not that hard to weld things like that. If you, you just have to have a very well thought of procedure and and follow because um, we did a lot of like hot taps for example a lot like that so when people are doing hot taps on live lines it's a very similar situation people have gotten really good at it. they can hot tap on high carbon they do, do it in plant piping where the carbon flow tend to be a lot higher and, and so you, you can design your well procedure Yeah, my uh, <coughs> class experience, we had some high carbon stuff to weld on, so yeah. we had a, a, a had the manufacturer make us up a can of, uh, make us up material with a similar carbon equivalent, yeah. and then that's what we qualified and we did our procedure on that, and that was it. But you have to have something made that's got that high of a carbon, exactly. that match the stuff that's yeah. in the ground. You want to be at least as high or perhaps yeah. higher yeah. on your so carbon. On your carbon we got a sample material, did our procedure, did the test, and we went. Yeah, and you can well just about anything if you if you if you, if you, if you pull the right if you really pay attention to what you're dealing with. Yeah, with no records, you got to go and take the filings off and send it into the lab. Exactly. Determine what the carbon equivalent is. Right, and that's where these guys probably got caught. It's probably they just said, "Well, hey, this is here's the spec spec for the pipe." 
you know, there's no reason to believe it had, you know, that much of that high a carbon equivalent, so they didn't, they didn't, didn't factor that into it. Yeah, the wells are fine on that, and that vintage because, uh, you know, but it's, it's when you got to go in, like you said, when you got to go in and repair them, right? That's where the problems lie. And, and the steels today have different problems because, of, like I say, the, the chemistry's changed a lot. And so, you, with all the micro alloy additions, you run into different kinds of carbon fiber. Right? I just had a comment. Uh, it's not regarding carbon steels, but I was uh, working at Suncor and we were welding a uh, four inch thick, 14 inch uh, ID uh, ink and piping on a hydrogen furnace. Yeah. And, and it's been in service since the 60s, right? So, we finished it up. We rooted it, hot passed, they x-rayed it, it was good. We filled it up, did it, did a LPI, linear indications around the site. We started digging it up, LPI again, all the way down to we went to the roof. Four, like four inches deep. It really cracked right through. Right through. We ended up having to uh, do like a back step procedure okay. to minimize the, I guess it's the shrinkage, right? Distribute how quick the heat was. And it took us two weeks to weld it. So it's just uh, yeah, good just a comment on yeah, really good example. Yeah, yeah. you got to yeah, because you guys are going to run into all kinds of challenges like that. There's, there's lots of cool stuff to get the weld these days. That one sounds like it was one. It was, it was great. I had a big picture. Would it be fair to say that today the MIT <coughs> techniques are a lot more sophisticated? Like we have spark testers for carbon equivalency. Yes. We have good hardness testers. We have ultrasound methods that are very sophisticated, completely blind to the well of sound. A lot of this stuff, you know, when you do the data, request these techniques, find out what that steel is. Yes. Do the hardness test. Get the carbon equivalency. It's easy. Just request it from the NDT company. Yeah. No, the, the NDT and the, the ability to, to test things on site now and get a good handle on what you're dealing with is, is, is improved tremendously. However, one thing I did learn after joining an NDT company was, was as an engineer, I, I have a lot more faith in NDT until I actually joined an NDT company and started working with a lot of the level threes and really started to understand the limits and the probability of detection. They're, they're as good as the technologies are, just like I showed in that first example. And that, that well defect got through two, two UT scans before it failed on hydrogen. And as good as NDT technologies are, they can still miss things. And you really have to understand the limitations of each one of the techniques you use. Because none of them are perfect. But there are getting better, they're getting more and more sophisticated every year. As computer technology improves, they're getting a lot better. Any other questions? Uh, yeah. So why did that heat up ER uh, the I don't know yet. We're still we're still taking it. We just set the stuff off, set those two samples off for analysis uh, last week. So we don't know yet. All right, I'll just you thank you one more time. Um, so